Hello, this is Tegram and Stephen Janice on the ground covering the 2024 Wisconsin election. And most of us woke up to a decidedly different country. Donald Trump's resounding victory exemplifies a nation that has shifted red and that seems unconcerned about Trump's violent rhetoric and often racist statements. But our job is not to comment on President Donald Trump's behavior, but rather to understand why people have embraced it. That's why we're out here today to discuss some of the voters we spoke to and what they had to say about his support. Well, Stephen, I realized that this election was about to shift in a decidedly unexpected way when we were outside of Centennial Hall interviewing voters. Tell me about some of the things that you noticed. Well, yeah, we had uh, a, a couple of people, uh, you know, random people that we just spoke to who had voted for Trump right in the heart of Milwaukee and in and, and a precinct that serves students from nearby Marquette University and University of Milwaukee. So I was a little stunned. You know, I don't know if you were, but I was, and I was also stunned by their reasoning. And now let's listen to a young woman explain why she voted for Donald Trump and her interesting reasoning on reproductive rights. I voted for Donald Trump today, yes. Now, there are a lot of different policies uh, former President Trump has. Are there any of his policies that he had from the previous administration that you'd like to see him carry out if he has another term? I actually have no idea. <laughs> well, let me ask you like this. I'm, I'm just curious your thoughts on reproductive rights. Um, I think that one too. That one's, a, that one's probably the most controversial topic that I can think of. Um, I think everyone has a right in their own bodies. Um, I did hear that Donald Trump was leaving it up to the states to be able to decide um, what is going to happen with abortion and uh, those rights for women. I believe that women should have a choice, um, but I also feel like Donald Trump does a great job in leading our country, and I think overall his policies are a bit better structured than Kamala's. Um, I'm 50-50 on that one, but I do believe that overall he would be the better candidate for our country. And my, my, very, my very last uh, question, um, you mentioned that there are other policies of his that you think are good compared to Harris. Maybe you could just give me an example of one, because I can understand reproductive choice being a controversial one. Is there one that you like more than what Vice President Harris is offering? I'm not sure on policies exactly. I think regarding the border, I do get concerned that there are so many people entering our country with um, access to a lot of things that I think U.S. citizens don't have access to. Um, so I do believe in cracking down on the border and making it a little bit more strict on who can be in our country and what, they're, what they have access to. And then we had an encounter with a young man who had an unusual reason for voting for President Donald Trump take a listen. So Brian, can you tell me what issue was important to you that brought you out to the polls today? So I'm a California, I'm originally from California, and I think immigration is one of the bigger issues. But apart from that, I've just noticed a lot of changes that I don't like with regard to the media I typically consume, not like news and stuff, but just, you know, artistic stuff or creative things. And I've just noticed a shift from creativity to towing the party line or the social line, like whatever is acceptably, whatever is acceptable in the social context. And I just, I don't like it. Sorry. Wow, that's interesting. Um, so when you say, when you're talking about creativity media, are you th talking about like content creators, people who talk online, or are you like literally describing like visual media or? Media, visual media would be a really good example, like, for example, Lord of the Rings. That's the, that's the one that like really comes to mind right now because I just watched a video last night about it. Do you mean the Lord of the Rings that Amazon produced? Yes. Okay. So what did, what did you take issue with? I don't like how <clears throat> the original content uh, produced by Tolkien has been changed to fit the social narrative that is accepted today. I don't know. So is, okay, that's fine. So let me, let me see if I can guess. Does that mean you didn't like seeing a black lady dwarf? No. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, that's then not I'm confused. why. I, I, that is part of it though. Oh, okay. <clears throat> because it's not necessarily that she's a black lady dwarf. It's just, it's actually not even that. It's just, 
The creators of the current Lord of the Rings show have supplanted have supplanted the original content in favor of pushing real life issues such as like minority representation, LGBTQ. Like those things, yes, they're important, but they don't really have a place in like like this is about elves, orcs and dwarves, you know, fighting and stuff. I'm like what does this have to do with the current zeitgeist? You know, I watch that stuff because I want to get away from what is currently happening. You know, I don't want to always be bombarded with this stuff, you know? I see what you're saying. You're looking for an escape, not another um, interpretation that brings in present day issues. Yeah, like, you know, we watch movies because we want to be taken away from where we are. You know, you mentioned immigration. I'm curious, um, whose immigration policy do you prefer? I prefer Trump's. And may I ask what you're hoping will be done at the border? More control. Yeah. Now, there was a mention of a deportation of nearly 20 million people. Do you, What kind of impact do you think that might have on our economy? I mean, just as an example, California in the agricultural sector, um, undocumented as well as documented folks working um, to put food on our tables is anywhere between 40 to 60 percent, depending on, you know, what type of crop it is. So don't you see there might be a possible economic impact or do you think that that will be offset in some kind of way? There's definitely going to be an economic impact and it will probably probably be pretty severe initially. But I think we'll I think we'll adjust. So, Stephen, these young people, they're part of what's known as Generation Z, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So these folks, what did you think of their reasoning? I was somewhat surprised by some of the cultural reasons that were suggested as well. Yeah, it seemed very detached from policy and specifically understanding the mechanics of policy and more based on, you know, what people have been talking about vibes. But I think there's a reason for that. I think partially it has to do with the media ecosystem that younger people are immersed in, like TikTok, where it's very hard to like sort of parse a very complex policy decision. Like for like the young woman talking about the fact that Donald Trump had returned to the states, even though that had meant that 20 states now literally banned abortion and she seemed not to be cognizant of that and conversely the young man who seemed to be i guess focused on the lord of the rings as right. a he, it was interesting because the word he wouldn't use but i knew was there was woke and his concern was that mm -hmm. his art his visual culture had been affected by politics had been mm -hmm. affected by what he considered an agenda he mentioned specifically lgbtq issues and racial issues that he felt were present day, present day issues that he didn't want in his art Art. He wanted to escape, he said, but I mm -hmm. think he was genuinely uncomfortable with modern day issues being represented in art. But however, isn't that what always happens with art? Isn't the modern day always reflected in an interpretation of any sort of creative yeah. project, whether right. it's a book that's being adapted or a movie, right? Yeah, I mean, well, art is technically supposed to be mimetic that is reflective of the society from which it is created. But I think there's also another aspect of it. I think we're dealing with what would be, you know, the first generational inequality election where the Democratic Party turned away from Bernie. Sanders and kind of became a corporatist entity, even though really technically the Biden administration moved significantly from the idea, you know, of neoliberalism. I think that what happened was is we have departed from a serious policy discussion to a more ephemera. And, you know, obviously these students to me who should be able to grasp it, we're not able to grasp the technical or sort of the specifics of policy. And I think that's why, you know, they probably they voted basically on, you know, more like a, a TikTok meme or something. And it's not just TikTok's fault. There are plenty of other right. areas of our right. social media ecosystem that have essentially flattened the conversation. It's very right. difficult to have a nuanced conversation right. when you've got a one minute or a three minute well, deadline. Let me ask you a question as a woman. You saw the young woman saying, well, you know, he, received, he turned over abortion rights to the states. How did you feel about that? Well, I was somewhat shocked that mm -hmm. she so deeply misunderstood the policy, whether one is for or against women having the right to choose, to state that turning it over to each individual state to decide means that it will interfere with a woman's right to choose if that's what you want. And in this woman's case, she thinks women should have the right to choose. So her not realizing right. turning it over to the states actually resulted in abortion bans across yeah. the board, it was somewhat disappointing. And that's something we've talked about 
and we talked about in, in several debate after several debates, we have discussed with the Real News the disconnect between policy and people's perception of how things work is is really vast. I mean, we've had the you know Infrastructure Act, we've had the Inflation Reduction Act, very specific policies that have benefited people. We have one of the strongest economies in the world right now. We do have the strongest we economy. We recovered from COVID in a way other yeah. nations could only dream yeah. from. And low unemployment and all these things that hasn't resonated with people. I understand inflation. I mean, I personally understand inflation, but it even inflation is down now and still people think this country is somehow wrongly positioned. And so, you know, I think we're dealing with a different political reality that the old formulas won't work. Well, it's interesting because so many people um, that are Republican, I would say, want smaller government and yet at the same time expect the government to fix our grocery bills. So it's kind of a conundrum. Right. If you want smaller government, then you can't expect government well, to fix all of your problems. You make a really good question, a really good point. No one in the mainstream media ever pushed back on the Republicans and they said, we're going to lower inflation. But no, how? But how? I mean, it's the Fed that controls the money supply and the Fed that controls interest rates, which ultimately control how the economy responds to monetary incentives. So it really, no one ever pushed back on Republicans and said, how are you going to solve inflation? But we do not want to end this totally on a bad note, right? right. We don't want to end this on a negative note, uh, either throwing accusations at any party. What we would like to do is celebrate some of the first time voters, because one thing that we can all feel good about is people becoming civically engaged as first time voters, whether they're 18 or 80, we're happy to see it. May I have your first name, please? Jasmine. And I heard that you're a first time voter, is that correct? Yes, it is. And so, what brought you out today? What brought you out? What was important to you? Why does this election matter to you? It matters to me because I was able to make a choice. I was able to take my own thoughts and what I felt and take it in and be able to really like show it in the world in a way. Hold on, us younger folks really can't. So definitely that, being able to use my voice. Now, as a first time voter, I heard the whole room burst into applause for you. How did that feel? How did it feel actually, you know, seeing everybody celebrate you like that? It's exciting. You don't get it much. So it was definitely warming. It was okay. I'm being hurt. This is the first step. This is the first thing. So it was exciting. It was warming. I want people to know that it's okay to, you know, have your own opinion, to not follow by anybody else's, you know, thoughts or, you know, comments, anything. We have our own opinion. We have our own choice. So I feel that's the biggest thing right now. So Taya, it was really, you know, when you're actually in the polling place, when someone votes for the first time, yes. they applaud. They and it was really... It was beautiful. Yeah. And it was nice because these were very enthusiastic young people who really were glad to be engaged. And, and it was, you know, heartwarming no matter what happens in the election, whatever outcome you feel, it's always good to see that we can still participate in this process, right? Absolutely. And we saw some really adorable young children with their parents. And it was just so lovely to see them be interested in the process. And of course, those 18-year-olds voting for the first time, they seemed a little shy, but I could tell they loved the attention. So it turns out you voters have something kind of special about you. Uh, what's a little bit different about you folks? Um, first time voters. And are you excited to be a first time voter? Yes, I am. So was there anything in particular that brought you out that you're excited about this election? No. no? I don't know. I don't know what to say. Well, as a first time voter, is there any particular, as a first time voter, is there any particular issue that's very important to you? Just want to make the the environment better. Okay. And for you, is there a vote, uh, is there a position that matters to you? Any particular policy? Besides, no policy, but besides the president, don't forget about the legislative branches and all the other branches. That's an excellent point. The down ballot really does matter. Now, can I ask you a question? Would you be willing to share with me who you voted for? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. So, Stephen, before we go, there's one thing I had to ask. For those who were supporting progressive policies, those who were Democrats or even further on the left, is there anything for them to be optimistic about? Well, I'm going to put a pessimistic, optimistic view on this. No, but seriously. So I think Trump is going to execute some really damaging policies that are really going to hurt all of us. And we're all going to suffer. But maybe out of that, we'll realize the value of progressive policy making, And maybe through that, we'll understand how important it is to embrace the complexity of progressive policies. And we'll see that, you know, 
it really isn't great, you know, to vote on a vibe and to vote for someone who really has, I think, bad policy chops. And we will learn what, what happens when, when, when that person is allowed to execute those policies. So I think the silver lining is that we can, you know, hopefully out of what happens post, you know, once Trump is president, we can actually see how valuable it is to talk about good policy and be progressives. And I think that's really, really important. Get past some of the things that hold back the left and the Democrats and actually say, you know what, we're... We can, we, can, we can create great policies that can make for a better country. So I hope that's kind of optimistic, not terribly optimistic, but somewhat. Well, Stephen, um, I hope your optimism is able to reach people because I know there are a lot of people out, out there right now that are absolutely heartbroken. And mm -hmm. there, of course, are people out there who are celebrating. Um, all we can hope is that as a country, we can find some way to move forward in a united fashion. Mm. This is Teo Graham and Stephen Janis reporting for The Real News Network in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.